Welcome to this second presentation about Formula Student Electric Vehicles. In this presentation, I will discuss the pre-charge and the discharge circuits. This presentation is intended for new teams, students and scrutineers who are familiarising themselves with the EV rules. This is not a how-to video. I will not be telling you how to design your car. I will be pointing out the key rules that you need to comply with and suggesting pitfalls that you should avoid. First, a personal introduction. My name is Craig Powers. I'm a control systems engineer in the power industry. Motorsport is just a hobby and I have my own single seat race car. I have been volunteering at Formula Student since 2003 in many roles, including in Germany and Russia, and I have been an EV scrutineer for the last six years. So let's see what the 2020 Formula Student rules say about the pre-charge circuit. A pre-charge circuit must be provided that charges the tractive system to at least 95% of the accumulator voltage before closing the second or final AIR. This is an increase in voltage threshold from 2019 when only 90% was required. The rules require that actual voltages be measured and compared. Therefore, the pre-charge circuit must monitor the accumulator versus tractive system voltages. It is no longer permissible to use an open loop method involving timers. That was removed from the rules a few years ago. The pre-charge must use a mechanical normally open relay. The pre-charge circuit and the tractive system active lights are closely related. The T-cell rules require that the AIRs and pre-charge relay states are monitored. If any AIR or pre-charge relay is in the closed state when the shutdown circuit is open, then the T-cell should illuminate to indicate that there is a potentially dangerous condition. Therefore, I recommend that you use AIRs and pre-charge relay with an auxiliary monitoring contact for use by the T-cell circuit. You should try to use a relay with mechanically ganged contacts so that the main pre-charge contact and its auxiliary contact are guaranteed to have the same states. In the functional safety industry, we refer to these as forcibly guided contacts. So I suggest you Google for forcibly guided contacts and safety relays to understand the relay options. So let's consider a typical HV tractive system. This is a simplified diagram. We have an accumulator housing containing the accumulator main fuse and two AIRs which switch the positive and negative poles of the accumulator. All of this is inside an accumulator housing. The DC feeds an inverter which produces a controlled three-phase supply to a single AC motor. A high voltage disconnect HVD is included to break the DC path. The inverter has inbuilt capacitance. So if we were to close the two AIRs together, then there would be a significant inrush current that could stress the HV components. In particular, it could cause arcing at the AIR contacts, thereby shortening their life or risking the contacts welding. This would be even worse if the AIRs were to immediately reopen due to a fault whilst carrying this transient inrush current. Hence the pre-charge rules, which require a gradual charging of the tractive system capacitance. We can charge the tractive system capacitance via a resistor. If the capacitor is initially discharged and the DC voltage is applied at time t equals naught, then the capacitor voltage will rise exponentially. The product of the resistance in ohms and the capacitance in farads is the time constant of the series RC network. After one time constant, the voltage will reach 63% of the applied DC voltage. After three time constants, the voltage will reach 95% of the applied DC voltage. The initial inrush current is limited by the pre-charge resistor. 
and can be calculated simply by Ohm's law across the resistor because the resistor drops all of the voltage at time t equals naught. The current decays as an exponential. It is important now to state one of the golden rules, probably the most important safety rule of Formula Student Electric, in my opinion. There should be no unswitched HV outside of the accumulator. Therefore, the AIR and the pre-charged switching contacts need to be inside the accumulator container. The AIRs and pre-charge relay can only close if all elements of the shutdown circuit are satisfied and additional actions have been carried out by the driver to activate the tractive system. I've produced a separate video about the shutdown circuit. Here we see a fairly common arrangement of pre-charge relay and resistor, both being inside the accumulator housing. The pre-charge and power-up sequence is as follows. First, AIR1 and the pre-charge relay are closed and the capacitance starts to charge via the pre-charge resistor. When 95% voltage is reached, then the second AIR can be closed. Opening the pre-charge relay is optional because AR2 shunts the pre-charge resistor and relay. So is this a permitted arrangement? Yes, it is, because the pre-charge resistor and the relay are both inside the accumulator housing. What about this arrangement? Is this allowed? Yes, the pre-charge resistor can be outside of the accumulator housing as long as the pre-charge relay is inside the accumulator housing. Remember that there must be no unswitched HV outside of the accumulator housing. What about this arrangement? Is this allowed? No, this is not allowed because there is unswitched HV outside of the accumulator. So what is the correct or best design? Where should we physically put the pre-charge relay and resistor? Where should we relocate the pre-charge controller? How do we implement this 95% voltage comparison? Is it hardware or software? And what piece of equipment controls the pre-charge? There is no right or wrong solution as long as you follow those golden rules, that there is no unswitched HV outside of the accumulator housing. So the design is very much up to you. But some architectures are simpler than others, and some minimise the risk of unwanted HV outside of the accumulator. And some solutions minimise wiring and connections. So I will leave it to you to decide. But please remember that the pre-charge system must be integrated with the shutdown circuit and monitored by the tractive system active light. We have experienced a problem at Formula Student UK with the energy meters or data loggers. The voltage measurement channel of the meters draws a current from the circuit that it is measuring and places a very small load on the tractive system. This is only relevant during pre-charge. If your pre-charge is very gentle, then the current drawn by the energy meter can equal the current flow through the pre-charge resistor. Then an equilibrium is reached and you may never exceed the 95% charging threshold. I have simplified the HV tractive system diagram just to show the current path during the pre-charge phase. I've included in red the input resistance of the voltage sense circuit of the energy meter. I've simplified the HV diagram further to show the pre-charge circuit as an RC network. I'll now perform the basic maths to illustrate the pre-charge resistor limitation. I want to stress that this only occurs with very gentle pre-charge. So, at steady state, there's no flow going into the capacitor and the voltage across the capacitor is solely dictated by the potential divider. Now, if we're going to reach 95% of accumulator voltage, 
then we need at least 95% across the resistor R log, which is the input impedance of the voltage sense stage. So if we do a little bit of rearranging of the equation, we find that the precharge resistor needs to be 1 19th of the logger input resistance. Now, I recall that the logger input resistance is 47 K ohms. So that sets a limit for the precharge resistor of approximately 2.47 K ohms. So the precharge resistor needs to be significantly less than the 2.47 K ohms limit to guarantee that it will work with the Formula Student UK energy meters. You'll need a fairly fast, strong precharge to ensure that you reach the 95% precharge requirement. I would suggest a maximum precharge resistance of, say, 1.5 K ohms. Well, this is just a rough estimate. If you think that your circuit is likely to experience a problem, then I suggest you contact the UK competition via the FS question database discuss, to discuss what options are available. It's possible that the Formula Student UK may have resolved this issue before the summer 2020 competition. Finally, um, a word of caution. If your inverter or motor controller has internal resistances, e.g. an internal discharge resistor, then you'll need to rework my calculations to determine your own design constraints. It's just simple theory of resistor networks and potential dividers. So let's now discuss the discharge circuit. Rule EV 6.1.5 sets a requirement for the tractive system to discharge below 60 volts DC and 25 volts RMS AC within five seconds of the AIR's opening. This safety rule ensures that inherent capacitance e.g. in the inverter or motor controller, does not store up any potentially harmful charge. Now, some commercial units will have their own internal bleed-off resistance that discharges the capacitance. But you'll have to read your equipment specs to see if that meets the five-second rule. If not, then you will need an external discharge circuit. If you do need an extra discharge circuit, then it will need to meet the discharge circuit rules in EV 4.9. EV 4.9 has some very specific rules about the power rating of the discharge resistor and its ability to withstand multiple discharges and tractive system voltage. Be very careful about the location of discharge resistors and the ability to dissipate heat be careful that the dissipated heat cannot adversely affect any adjacent components. The discharge resistor needs to be connected in parallel across the tractive system when the car is shut down. So this requires a normally closed contact that is switched by the shutdown circuit. The discharge resistor circuit must not be fused. Uh, please ensure that your discharge resistor can withstand the full tractive system and does not become a fuse itself. The discharge circuit must still be able to operate when the accumulator is disconnected from the car and also able to discharge the tractive system if the HVD is removed. So this dictates where the discharge resistor is required to be electrically connected. So let's look at some possible arrangements. Is this arrangement allowed? No, that is not permitted because the discharge resistor is on the accumulator side of the HVD. What about this? Is this allowed? No, definitely not permitted. The discharge resistor must remain with the car when the accumulator is removed. What about this arrangement? Is this OK? Yes. This is OK because the discharge resistor is on the inverter side of the HVD and is able to discharge the internal capacitance even if the HVD is removed or if the accumulator is removed from the car. So let's look at the common mistakes made on the precharge circuit. The first one is an open loop precharge purely based on timers. Now that's the old rules and you're not allowed to do that anymore. 
the precharge control circuit must measure the actual accumulator and tractive system voltage and compare them for the 95% threshold. We also see unswitched HV outside of the accumulator. That's the golden rule that I talked about. And that's caused by having the precharge relay and resistor both located outside of the accumulator housing. We regularly see that precharge relays and AIRs are not monitored by the T cell circuit. I think T cell circuit non compliance is the biggest problem that we see at Formula Student UK. We also see overly complex designs with far too many relay coils and contacts, and there's absolutely no need for it because if you have a decent architecture and put the components in a sensible place, then it all drops out very simply. There are a number of common mistakes on the discharge circuit. The most obvious one is a discharge relay which does not use a normally closed contact, so the discharge circuit does not fail closed. We see discharge circuits which have a fuse fitted, and this is against the rules. We see discharge resistors with the wrong power rating, such that the discharge resistor overheats. We see discharge resistors with inadequate cooling or inadequate heat sink. And we see discharge resistors which are placed too close to other components, and that causes damage to those components due to their heat dissipation. So in summary, we've discussed the precharge circuit and the discharge circuits. We've discussed the reasons for having these, and we've discussed the specific rules, and we've discussed good and bad architectures. And I've also touched on some common mistakes that we see at the UK competition. I would like to stress that this is my own work. It's not official or sanctioned by any of the Formula Student or SAE organisations or competitions. I've provided my email address and would welcome any feedback or discussion, but I cannot answer any specific questions about your car and its entry to a Formula Student or SAE competition. I cannot answer any eligibility questions. So I would urge you to use the formal mechanism, which in the case of the UK is the Formula Student Question Database. Thank you very much.